Amen. Be lifted higher. If you're able to continue standing for the reading of the word, we're going to jump into Genesis 1, 26 through 31. Then God said, let us make man in our image. According to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them. And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, see, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth. And every tree whose fruit yields seed to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth in which there is life. I have given every green herb for food. And it was so. Then God saw everything that he made. And indeed, it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. This is the word of the Lord. All right, good morning. Well, welcome. Uh, welcome to Regeneration Church. Um, check, check. Let's see, check. Is this one on? They could probably hear it on. There we go. Thank you in the house. Um, yeah, welcome to Regeneration Church. Uh, my name is Matt. We are going through um, a topical teaching series here that we are starting today called Head, Heart, and Body. But before we do that, I just want to just say we're glad that you're here. Um, you know, in, in our, our world, God calls a community, a church, to gather together. Um, we thank you for those that are watching online as well to be a part of that community in which we try to live out and worship the Lord, uh, growing as disciples following Jesus. And so if you are online, then if you could um, just say hello, if you could like or share or subscribe so that you know when these videos are going to be posted. It's always live on Sunday mornings, but people can watch them later on. And so uh, this morning, I would like you to just say hello to someone. Introduce yourself. If you're here live, if you're online, then just say hello and um, get to know just someone around you just for a, a minute here. Well, um, <laughs> it's good to see you guys saying hello and, and uh, greeting one another if you're online. Also, um, is this on? Can you guys hear this? Okay. <laughs> you know, this is awesome. All right, there we go. Thank you. Thank you. You can hear. Um, this is an introvert's worst nightmare. They're like, oh no, I have to see someone, talk to someone. And for the extroverts, we're telling you, okay, shut up now. Okay, like, like stop. And, and so, um, but in community, God's called us more than just watching online, more than sitting in a room next to people to get to know people, to begin to, um, share life with one another, to begin to pray for one another. Uh, I want to um, in, encourage you, if you don't know someone, you're like, hey, do you want to grab lunch afterwards? You realize if you don't have a few people's phone numbers, 
or at least uh, one person's phone number uh, in your phone. When we got, not only when COVID shut things down, but also during the fires, we realized how inadequate it was if we didn't have people's phone numbers. We're like, have you seen so-and-so? Oh, I did. I, I haven't seen them in a while. And like, we're scrambling, trying to get a hold of people, making sure they're okay. So um, that's the, the body of Christ is something where God desires for us to know one another. I want to share with you briefly why we're doing this topical series. Uh, we were going to be starting the book of John. But I just really started thinking and praying about things as it pertains to the, the cultural situation that we're in today and, and realizing that um, in this rapidly shifting world that we live in, there's so much confusion. So uh, we wanted to address some of these things and then letting you know as well on Wednesday evenings in June, we're going to start the book of Ephesians. That's going to be on Wednesday nights. And then um, this summer, we'll go through first and second Timothy. What is the church? What's the purpose of the church? Why do we exist as a church? What does the church teach? Uh, how does God form a church? And then Lord willing in the fall, we'll start the book of John. So that's kind of the plan and kind of what is coming um, up ahead. Also, um, I wanted to let you know this Wednesday evening during announcements, Derek's going to share a little bit more about it, but I would invite you to come out. It's going to be a time of just ministry in the body worship, a worship night, a time of prayer, a time of praying for one another. So that will be on Wednesday. So as we get into head, heart, and body, connecting them through the word and spirit, this is part one, biblical theology and spiritual reality. Uh, I see that in this rapidly shifting world we live in, there's so much confusion amongst Christians and even from other people that aren't Christians about what Christianity is. Now, some people in an effort to show compassion or to be culturally acceptable have at times compromised truth. Um, compromise, well, yeah, I know that the Bible says this, but in order to reach these people or to show kindness, I'm just going to kind of not focus on that. There are others that are more aligned with political or philosophical movements than they are with the kingdom of God. And it's kind of like that's the thing that draws people together. And yet there are others who have a lot of knowledge, even biblical knowledge, but aren't walking in the spirit. It, they might know sound doctrine, but they really don't have a love for others. They really don't have compassion for those. Um, as uh, God told Jonah, if you remember in the book of Jonah, this reluctant prophet, I want you to go to the people of Nineveh. And Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh. He's like, I can't stand those people. I want to go the opposite way. And God says, don't you have compassion for those people that don't know their right hand from their left? And there's a lot of people today that don't know their right hand from their left, so to speak. It's like, who is God? What is, how do we determine life? How do we determine what's right or wrong? A lot of confusion that is out there. So, when we consider head, heart, and body, I want to look at what it means to be human through biblical theology, looking at the whole arc of scripture, not just a little piece here or a, a proof text there. And let's trust the work of the Holy Spirit to help us understand the spiritual reality of God. There's a book that I would recommend right now. It's called Confronting Christianity by Rebecca McLaughlin. And um, in it, she talks about how 40 years ago, well, in the 1980s, the pre prediction socially was that the world would become more and more secularized, that religion would start to fade away. People would realize that religion kind of isn't important and religion can be bad. And while we've seen some decline in the West, you know, Europe and America, um, we've seen a rise in what is called the nuns, uh, N-O-N-E-S. That's the people that say, I have no religious faith, no religious affiliation. There's this rise. But worldwide, those who declare themselves agnostics or atheists is actually declining. There's too many times that we only see things in our own culture. We're only looking through things of what's happening in Santa Cruz or California or America or in Canada or in Europe, but worldwide, that level of um, number of agnostics and atheists is actually declining. They think that in the next 40 years, it will go from 16% down to 13%. Do you realize Christianity is actually growing in places like China, um, South America, 
Africa and even parts of the Middle East. And while we may not see that kind of growth in North America or Europe, in other parts of the world, there's this growth of Christianity. So could it be at least partially um, in the West that we're addicted to the values that get to seep into our cultural conscience under the radar through stories that are told via entertainment and technology. Sometimes there are things that we would reject outright if someone just told us, hey, this is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to get you to change your philosophy in life and to become more like this. But if it's in a story, if it's in a song, if it somehow wraps up the emotions, and sometimes we listen to those things and, and it's so easy to kind of get like drawn into those things. It also could be that we're losing our fitting, uh, our, our footing, because we stopped our understanding of the Bible and theology at an elementary school level. An elementary school level. Um, all of my kids went to Christian school growing up from kindergarten through um, eighth grade. And and sometimes when you, when, you know, when they were little, you know, the Sunday school answer or the Christian school answer, you would ask them this deep question and their answer was always Jesus, right? Because that's how they're, they're taught. And while, yes, Jesus is the answer, I didn't ask you about that. I just asked you like, what team do you want to win? Or, you know, some, some other thing. But, it, you know, it's like this elementary school understanding of Christianity that, that kind of gets stunted in it, its growth a little bit. It could also be that the nuns are growing in America because we have let the passing pleasure of sin and the pride of self-centeredness corrupt our thinking and really affect our loves, our affection. First um, John uh, 121, John says, little children, speaking to those that he was pastoring and discipling, he said, keep yourself from idols. Because idolatry is really replacement of God for that central place in our lives. And idolatry doesn't mean necessarily a statue that is carved that's an idol. That, that could be an idol. But an idol could just be a philosophy. It could be idolatry of a, a way of life. Um, some of the questions that, that we face, we have to be able to give an answer in a way that is with respect. From the Net Bible, the New English Translation, which by the way, is fantastic if you have the Net Bible online. Their footnotes are as long as the Bible itself because it has a word study on almost every word. Incredible. Um, listen to this, 1 Peter 3, 14 through 17. It says, but in fact, you happen to suffer for doing, if in fact you happen to suffer for doing what is right, you are blessed. But do not be terrified of them or be shaken, but set Christ apart as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks about the hope you possess. Yet do it with courtesy and respect, keeping a good conscience so that those who slander your good conduct in Christ may be put to shame when they accuse you. So we should have this good conscience being able to, to answer people with this reverence, this gentleness, and with this respect. And if we are to do what Peter wrote, if we're to be ready to answer anyone who asks us about the hope we possess, first of all, we need hope. If we don't have hope, then we can't give them a reason for hope. Hope is not, the Christian doctrine of hope is not hope so. If someone buys a lottery ticket, that's hope so. I hope so. But there's no confident expectation that that lottery ticket is going to win. When people buy lottery tickets, they don't go out and put a deposit down on a home and say, I, I, because I'm going to win, I know I'm going to win, so I could buy this house. It's hope so. And if I win, then I could buy a house. Our Christian faith, the hope that we have is a hope that says, it's a hope that is sure and steadfast, does not disappoint. Therefore, I could live my life now according to the hope that I possess. So when it comes to these hard questions that people ask, hard questions for the world's biggest religion, um, as it says in um, Confronting Christianity. Here, here are just a few of them. Doesn't Christianity crush diversity? Isn't it just about like one nation or one group of people or one ethnicity? Um, 
How can you say there's only one true faith? There are many people that have many different faiths. Isn't Christianity homophobic? Is there a homophobia amongst Christians? Is there, doesn't the Bible condone slavery? So we have to bring down the Bible because the Bible condones slavery. Hasn't science disproved Christianity? So we could kind of move on because we believe in science. How could a loving God send people to hell? Why would he do that? How could a loving God allow so much suffering? We see suffering not only over there in other parts of the world, but in our own lives. How, why would God allow us to go through that? Doesn't Christianity denigrate women? Doesn't it put women um, subservient to men? So these questions and more <laughs> are things that we are going to unpack slowly as we look to scripture and see, are these things true? So, when I think about our culture, while confronting Christianity is written by someone that has struggled, wrestled with these questions, and really came out with um, a, 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 an understanding and a hope in the Christian faith, there are other people today that are looking for an understanding of the world outside of religion, outside of the Bible. One of the books that has been a bestseller is the book Sapiens by Yuval Harari. The book uh, Sapien, uh, Sapiens, he has sold over 40 million copies. It's a lot of copies. And it's printed in 65 languages. And he's considered one of the most influential public intellectuals today. He was born in Israel, uh, received his PhD from Oxford, a lecturer in the history department at Hebrew University in Jerusalem. And yet when he covers Christianity, there are major flaws in his covering of how humans came into being, especially when it comes to Christianity. Very short, because he covers really thousands of years in a very uh, short time. Let me just read one part of this book. The idea that all humans are equal is a myth. So I want you to think about this. Here's someone that's saying, really, God does not exist. What he says, um, advocates and e e uh, equality and human rights uh, people may be outraged by this line of reasoning. We believe in particular order, not because it is objectively true, but because believing in it enables us to cooperate effectively and to forge a better society. I want you to hear what he says in his book. Equality is not true. It's really a myth. The only reason why we believe in equality, when, when we think about um, our own Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident. He's saying it's not self-evident. In fact, we have developed these myths about being created in the image of God and being self-evident just so that we could get along as a culture and society and we don't destroy one another. In order to cooperate, human beings have come up with religion and religion is their way of trying to get along to get this. That's what Yuval Harari says. And while there may be parts of Sapiens that includes truth, even when it comes to religion, his understanding of Christianity is very inaccurate. Um, his understanding of Christianity is what I would call a caricature. Um, do you know what a caricature is? I'm going to give uh, three examples of caricatures. And uh, when I ask for the first one, just someone tell me who this is. All right, the first one over on the left, who is that? Jack Nicholson, okay. In the middle, who is that? Will Smith. Will Smith. And over on the right, who is that? Justin Bieber. Justin Bieber, thank you. All right. Now, this is not them. This is what is known as a caricature. A caricature is a rendered image showing features of its subject in a simplified, oversimplified, or exaggerated way. So what this caricature does, these caricatures, it shows overemphasized characteristics. For Bieber, it's the hair. For Will Smith, it's the ears. For Jack Nicholson, it's his forehead. Um, people have caricatures of what Christianity is. And when I talk to most people about what Christianity is, they think they know, but all they have is this caricature. They have this oversimplified or over-exaggerated way of seeing things. 
When I was a kid, um, there were these poles that held up the, the roof in the corridor and we would walk through them. I was probably, you know, a younger elementary school, like third grade. We started climbing these poles, trying to get to the top to touch the roof. When you got up there, you felt like you were just on top of the world. You felt like you were looking down on everyone. You were so high. By the time I got to junior high, we could jump up and touch the roof. And what seemed like it was so big as we grew ended up not being as big as we thought. It's kind of like if we get our understanding of Christianity stunted from times past or from caricatures, we may not have an accurate depiction of what Christianity is. And sadly, many Christians, when they become, you know, maybe even teenagers or young adults or even older adults still have a caricature understanding of the Christian faith where certain parts might be similar but are exaggerated. So when it comes to understanding how the head, our mind, our thoughts, and our heart, our emotions, our will, and our bodies, our physicality, how they're related, we need to start with God's intention rather than a caricature. And much of what people dislike about Christianity at time, at times is a caricatured version of Christianity. So our purpose in this series is to understand biblical theology about the mind, heart, and body. And by biblical theology, it means looking at the overall arc of scripture. It, it, it's more than just um, looking at one little part. It's looking at the whole of scripture. When we uh, think about um, number two, to look through the lens of the truth of scripture to understand God's word and world. I'm, I'm so thankful that during this very difficult time from 2019, fall of 2019 until today, I have been um, really blessed, privileged to be with a group of pastors from all over the country um, that we meet together every other month for a couple of days um, in a seminary cohort and realizing people from Alaska to Texas, to California, to different parts of the country, um, different denominations, we're all facing some of the same stuff. And we're trying to look at these things, make sense of God's word and the world through a theological lens with pastors and professors that are shepherding us through these things. And that has been incredibly helpful. Number three, to reflect Christ full of grace and truth in our culture. So, I was going to call this series Head and Heart. Maybe you've heard this before that when you hear a message and it's in your head, it's 18 inches from your head to your heart. And so sometimes it's like head knowledge, but it doesn't get transferred to the heart. And, and that's true sometimes. But for me, the way that I came to Christ was not head first. The way that I came to Christ was heart first. I, I was searching I was disillusioned. I was kind of empty with religion as I was brought up. And I was wondering, is there more to life? It, what is life really all about? What is my purpose? And I was kind of like Charlie Brown. You ever watch Charlie Brown's? Charlie Brown is like a cynical middle-aged man in a boy's body. Uh, was, I was kind of like that. kind of disillusioned with life a little bit. And... Um, so I started searching and I still remember the day in my garage, no one else around. And I just said this, I, I thought this thought, it wasn't even quite a prayer, but kind of God, if you're real, then show yourself to me. Like help me to know that you're real. Show me that you exist. Nothing happened there. But what happened is gradually God started to grip my heart. The Holy Spirit was doing a work in my life. And maybe you're somewhere in that process of wondering the way I was brought up or I've heard about Christianity or are these things true? Know that the Holy Spirit is drawing and it's not just up to us. It, if it were the smartest people in the world that were Christians, a lot of us would be like, well, I can't do it because I'm not smart enough. It's not a mental, it, you could be very intelligent, but it's not a mental thing where you become a Christian if you're smart enough and you understand enough. See, 
There are other people who come to faith in Christ because of an intellectual questioning. And some of the most brilliant people around, people like Lee Strobel or Josh McDowell or C.S. Lewis came to Christ because they were trying to make sense of the world. And the more that they studied the Bible and the more that they studied the life of Christ, they realized that it was true. See, for me, it was the heart first. And as I started to trust God, then my junior year of high school, so that summer of my sophomore and junior year, I actually went to a youth camp. I went to a retreat. And the youth pastor there shared a message and it gripped me. And he said, if you want to receive Christ, then you could, you could pray. And I prayed a prayer. My best friend, Javier, I invited him to the retreat with me. I was hoping that he would come to Christ as well. Because when I prayed, as soon as I said, amen, I look around the room and I'm looking for Javier. Because I want to find out, did Javier also pray to receive Christ? And Javier ditched and he was going to meet a girl back in the cabin. And so he wasn't there. So I go looking for him. I find him in the cabin. He's bummed that this girl that he ditched and he was going to meet over in the cabin never showed up. And she was at the meeting. And so I told him what our pastor, youth pastor had shared. I think that's the first time, in fact, I'm, I'm sure of it. It's the first time I've ever told a friend, I love you. It felt awkward, but I, we grew up knowing each other since age three and four. But I said, Javier, I love you. And I said, and what he shared, I, I believe it's true. And I want you to be with me. And he listened. And so Javier now is a pastor in Utah. You know, he is, uh, we, we started walking with the Lord at around the same time. Um, but for me, I needed to examine, is this real? So my junior year of high school, I did a research paper in my AP English class, which if I'm going to do a research paper and do research and really struggle with something, he said, you have to come up with a provocative question and be neutral look at evidence, and then give your opinion backed up by evidence. And so my junior year AP English assignment, my research paper was, is Christianity credible? Is this religion, is this faith, is it credible? Is there something to it that's just beyond, you know, just hopes and dreams? But there's a third aspect. So I was thinking head and heart, and really I've been thinking about the body, now, um, something called physicalism, it's this metaphysical um, understanding, this metaphysical belief that everything is physical. Everything is material. It's tangible. The reason why you act the way that you do is just the hormones and the chemicals, the way that those things are affecting you differently than the way hormones and chemicals are affecting someone else. It's that the physical world supervenes everything. And so the body rules and however you feel is who and what you are and what you decide. Now, Darwin, uh, Darwinianism teaches natural selection. Some can take it to mean that you can't blame someone for not acting on whatever their body wants. Uh, you, you don't blame a lion for eating a zebra. It's just trying to survive. And so when people have bodies, you just follow that body wherever it goes. It also led to um, something called Epicureanism. It's an ancient, um, ancient school of philosophy founded in Athens by Epicurus that rejected determinism and advocated hedonism. Pleasure is the highest good. And where the ultimate pleasure was to be free from anxiety and mental pain, especially pain arising from fear or death or the gods. So instead of uh, thinking about fear or death or these metaphysical things, it's just go out and do whatever your body says to do. Now there was another school of thought when it comes to our, our head, you know, um, when it comes to our head, the Greek and Roman thought was that reason is what is associated with the soul. Um, how many of you know what a stoic is? Or someone that is stoic is, what do they say about stoics? No motion. They're just level. Um, 
British people are more stoic than American people. They keep that stiff upper lip, you know, and, and I'm, I'm kind of blown away that um, for the most part, you know, I'm overgeneralizing, but it's different parts of the world have these different views. Much of our Western culture, our, our thought has come from this Greek school of philosophy that taught that the highest good is based on knowledge. The wise live in harmony with reason. And you recognize what you can control. You determine your reaction to crisis. You seek to master yourself, not being a slave to your emotions. And the greatest virtue is mind over matter. And what happened is these two schools of thought pitted the, the, mind, the, the mind at war with the body. And so if stoicism had such an effect on the intellectual nature of Christianity. I mean, we know the four spiritual laws or uh, when, you, when you think about all of the, the creeds or you think about like different, uh, so much of systematic theology is in the mind. It's like mental and we have to overcome emotion. But then there's at times we've seen the neglect of the emotion. Anyone that has worked in counseling or in mental health knows that emotions are real. And yet there are times that we can't be slaves to emotion. At times we can't ignore emotion. So how do those things come together? They come together in this biblical understanding really that is pretty unique. It's the heart. Now, the biblical understanding of the heart is not just that it is the organ that pumps blood into our body. It is a physical organ, but when they say the heart, it's the understanding that the heart is the seat, not just of your emotions, but of what you trust the most. It is what you are committed to the most. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And what Jesus is referring to is the thing or the things that you most trust in, the things that you hope in, the things that capture your imagination. It's the center of your attention. It's the center of your commitments. So whatever your heart trusts in the most affects not only your emotions, but also your thinking. So in the biblical sense, the heart is the seat of the mind, the will, and the emotions. Now, we can easily say at the fall, our desires and our thoughts and our hearts got all messed up. But wait a minute, before we go into that, there are too many times we start the story of the Bible in Genesis 3. When we witness or we share faith with someone, sometimes we begin with sin. We begin with, well, We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's the Roman road, that conviction, that's the way of the master. And I understand all of those things are important for us to understand that there is a such thing as sin. But God doesn't start with Genesis chapter three, does he? God starts in the beginning with Genesis in chapter one. In Genesis chapter one, verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image, <clears throat> excuse me, in according to our likeness. Um, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all of the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. There is a book called Delighting in the Trinity that I, I read uh, a couple of months ago. It's the best book I've ever read on the Trinity because God in his own nature has relationship and community. God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And in that nature, let us create men. The word for men in the Hebrew is the word Adam, where we get Adam. So it's make humans, make Adam, man in our own image. But then notice he says, in the image, male and female, he created them, both men and women, sacredly created in the image of God. He created them, and then it goes on to say in verse 28, then God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Verse 31, it says, then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. 
Now, up until this point, it says, and it was good. It was good. Now, it was very good. So, evening and morning were the sixth day. Do you guys remember the first Star Wars? Does anyone remember the first Star Wars? Okay. What episode was that? It's episode four. If, you do, if you're not a Star Wars fan, you hate this. You're like, Star Wars is stupid. But uh, like, if you're a Star Wars geek like me, it was the greatest thing in the world as a kid. Uh, when I was like six years old, I stood, my brother got tickets. We stood in line at Man's Chinese Theater in Hollywood and for the midnight showing. And my world was opened up to the world of Star Wars. And it was this incredible thing. And I came home and bought one of those lightsabers and just, I would just imagine. And it was just incredible. The thing, though, is that George Lucas was masterful in starting the story in episode four because it draws you in. At the very beginning, you see this projection of R2-D2 saying, you know, there's, there's Princess Leia. Help us, Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're only, are our only hope. And, and you ask the questions immediately. Who's Obi-Wan Kenobi? You know, what's happening? What? And it kind of draws you in. It's very interesting to me that the saga began with episode four, and it wasn't until 20 years later that we got to episode one. Now, why do I digress like this? Because when we read the story of creation, it's like Adam and Eve are born into a war zone where the serpent is already there. It's like it picks up the story Something has happened. There's this mysterious serpent that is already there in the garden by the time you get to chapter three. It doesn't tell how the serpent got there. As God fights against evil, you know how he does it? One of his chief ways is by creating good. It's one of the best ways. When we fight against evil, we create good. And God has called us to be fruitful and to multiply, to be image bearers, to create more good in a world that is broken and a world where there's a lot of evil. So we create more good. It's his intention to be fruitful and multiply more image bearers of God. All of God's creation up to this point was good. But now after God gives them the command, bless them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, create culture, create families, create life, cities, all of these different things, then God said it was very good. So I'm going to have Elizabeth come up and she is going to give an illustration of this. Um, this is music appreciation class. Uh, <laughs> Elizabeth is saying, would you like to hear some music? And we say, I'd appreciate that. So um, Elizabeth is going to play, first of all, a nice melody. And, and what melody is this? It's from Debussy's first arabesque. Okay, from Debussy's first arabesque. All right. Okay, here's this melody. Listen to this. All right. That's good. All right. So that's that's good, right? If you're if you're <laughs> As a kid, you know, kids are just pounding on that thing. And then when kids finally start to put the notes together, it's good. Now, Elizabeth is going to add some chords to this. Now that's, that's better, right? There's chords. And, and like, um, you know, like jazz or classical music, people that are trained to hear those little nuances, they hear more than I would hear. Um, you know, the, the conductor of the orchestra hears way more than I, he, the conductor can hear, we need some highs, we need some lows, um, we need, you know, some more cymbals or something. So, She's going to fill this out. Elizabeth is going to fill in a little bit more about how the piece was actually written to be played.
good. <laughs> Thanks, Elizabeth. So as, as she was playing that, um, you could feel emotion. You could, it just, it brings you to a different place. You know, it's good. Notes are good. Chords, it's better. When you play the whole song a little bit more, but then when you play it the way that the, the composer wrote it to be played, it's very good. God says, I'm giving you this raw material. Here's your life. I'm giving you the, lo- the raw material of this world that you live in. Um, seed for fruit, seed for grain, uh, that, that's good. Grain is good. Bread is very good. <laughs> if you give someone a, oh, hey, I got some grain for you here. You're like, oh, thank you. You know, you just don't start chomping down on grain. You, you do something with that. You add some things to it and it becomes bread. It becomes very good. That's culture. And sometimes when it comes to culture, it's important not only to say, well, culture is good or bad. There is bad culture, uh, a culture of selfishness and pride and death. The way to fight it is not primarily to try to crush it, but really not even just to avoid it, but to create good culture. So therefore, now we get to Genesis 3, after God created this good culture, after God created relationship, after God created this sacred relationship where it's not just about doing commandments. Notice in Genesis 1, we don't even start off with 10 commandments. We just start off with be fruitful and multiply. But in the middle of the context of this, we we now know as the fall, it's when humans fell into sin. And I have a thought, instead of thinking of Adam and Eve's sin as the fall, as though they stumbled and they fell, we might consider calling it the turn. When humans turned away from God and went their own way. When human beings said, we are going to trust ourselves rather than trust you. And so the tree of the knowledge of good and evil is placed there precisely so that they have a choice. God is not restrictive. He said, from any tree of the garden you could eat. If you look in Santa Cruz County, you just look out there, are windows. There's trees everywhere. Imagine only one tree. Don't eat from that tree. Because in the day that you eat of it, you'll surely die. And the serpent comes and says, has God really said that? You will not surely die, number one, and you will be like God. You will be the one that determines, you will be the one that decides what is good and bad, good and evil. You make the choice, not God. And so in doing so, given this choice, humans chose not to trust in God and his love, but to go their own way and to define good and evil on their own. And parents, take heart. Don't think that your imperfect parenting puts the sole responsibility for bad choices on your shoulders or the sole responsibility of their good choices on your shoulders because God, the perfect parent, had two kids and they both went astray. But God, in his love, would not leave us in a fallen state forever. He wants relationship with us. So he will do whatever he can to draw us back to himself. And by the way, if you only think of Christianity as a set of performance indicators, then your relationship with God is transactional. God wants more than transactional. He wants relationship. He wants our hearts. He wants worship. When you understand his grace and love to draw you to himself, then you begin to understand what separates us is sin. And God wants to do something about that sin, not because he doesn't like you, not because he's against you, not because he hates you, but because that sin is the very thing that forms a barrier between you and him. And he wants to take care of that so much so that he did something about it, that Jesus came to live a life of relationship to the father that Adam should have led. And then Jesus took our sin upon himself by dying for us. The curse to Adam, the curse to Eve, in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. And Jesus died for our sin. While Adam blamed Eve and Eve blamed the devil Jesus took responsibility for something he didn't do. He took our responsibility for sin upon himself. And so when Jesus comes, this is the, what I would call the return. If Genesis 3 was the turn away from God, 
Jesus shows us this is what Adam should have done. It's the return. In Romans, Jesus is called the second Adam. And notice when he's asked these questions about the greatest commandment in Luke 12, 27, he answered and said, you shall love. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, with your thoughts, with your emotion, with your body, with your very essence of being, you shall love the Lord your God. And it's very interesting that he adds this, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself, because those are linked. So when we consider, instead of starting with the caricature of Christianity, what other people say about Christianity, we need to start with looking at Jesus himself. Maybe you say, well, I've seen so many hypocrites in the church. I have too. And I see one in the mirror at times. And I see people that are hypocrites outside of the church. And there are people that aren't Christians. And in their point of view, whatever they say is right, they don't hold up to those things 100% of the time. You ask any human being, do you live up to your own standards at 100% of the time? And they don't. No one does. So instead of starting with the character of Christianity, we need to start with Jesus. And that's what we'll be doing in this series. Jesus designed diversity. Do you realize in Acts chapter 2, day one that the church starts, there are Parthians and Medes and Elamites and a multi-ethnic group of people with different languages that are together on day one. It's, it's incredible. Do you realize that when Jesus elevates women, they get to tell the news of the risen Christ first. That their names are in Jesus' genealogy, which no other culture did that at that point in time. That Jesus desires mercy he said that you, um, God desires mercy and not just sacrifice. He wants us to be compassionate for others. He cares for the orphan. He cares for the widow. He cares for the immigrant. Jesus defines sexuality. There are so many times people say, well, Jesus doesn't address this. He does. When he's asked about whether or not people should be able to get a divorce, he doesn't just answer their question about divorce. He says, from the beginning, it was not so. He goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 1. When we think about, well, Christianity doesn't, you know, isn't really loving, Jesus demonstrates love by dying to himself. It, it, he even said this, that for, um, or, or Paul, you know, for even a righteous person, one might consider dying for them. But Jesus died for us and that while we were at enmity with God, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. That's love. Love isn't just, hey, I'm going to love whoever agrees with me. I'm going to love my enemy because God loved me when I was his enemy. It's Jesus draws us to repentance. He wants us to do the return. As we turned away from him, he calls us to return back to him. And that's why when Nicodemus, who was the religious leader of the time, came to Jesus at night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. No one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. So what is, is Nicodemus looking at? He's looking at Jesus' teachings. I really like your teachings. Your teachings are so good. No one can deny that. I look at the signs, the things that you do. But then Jesus answered and said to him, most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Don't think today that we're going to understand these things just intellectually or with our emotion or with our body. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God changes us from the inside out. The caricature of Christianity is you have to be good and then God will love you. The real essence of Christianity is none of us are good enough. God loves us. He poured out his life. He created a good world for us to know him and have a relationship. And when we turn away, we could come back to him. And when we come back to him, he restores relationship. And then he sets us free to be fruitful and multiply and to create more culture of goodness and to love others and show people what Jesus is like. That's Christianity. It is by the spirit of God. And I close with this scripture in 2 Corinthians 3, 5, and 6. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think of anything as being from ourselves. Paul isn't saying, follow us because we're so good. The church should never be saying, follow us because we're so good. But we should say, follow me as I follow Christ and point towards him. 
But our sufficiency is from God who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant. I'm not sufficient to even teach this Bible study this morning. It's God who makes us sufficient. This new covenant, not of the letter. If you think it's the letter of the law, doing good things, doing good works, following the rules, performance indicators, it brings death. But the spirit gives life. And this morning, I implore you to open up your heart to the Spirit of God. To open up your heart to say, God, fill me with your Holy Spirit. Jesus, thank you for what you've done for me. And help me to live this good and beautiful life in your kingdom so that I could help multiply and be fruitful and tell other people about the goodness of Jesus. And when I fall short, because I will, thank you for your grace and love and mercy that is there. And in this series, we are going to tackle some of the hardest questions that confronts the biggest religion in the world. We are going to look not at a caricature, caricature of Christianity. We are going to look at Christ and scripture. And if you've never received Christ as your Lord and your Savior, you could do that today by just saying, I do. It's just a beginning. It's not the end because we continue to grow, but today could be the beginning. And if you have thought some caricature of Christianity is what has kept you away, just know that's not Christianity. We need to look at Christ. So I'm going to pray, have the worship team come up over to my right and to your left. If any of you would desire prayer, if anyone wants prayer online, let us know. We want to pray for one another. So Father, we thank you so much for your word. God, we thank you for the good and beautiful world that you've created for us. And we thank you that we are created in your image. Father, the people that are walking around that don't know you, even people that might be against us or against Christianity, Lord, we, we know that they were created in your image. And God, they need to know that you love them and that you came, that we would have a relationship with you. I pray that you would draw them and that you would use us but today specifically, I also want to pray for those that maybe they, they've never opened up their heart. Maybe it's that first time like me in that garage when I was in high school saying, God, if you're real, I need to know. God, would you meet them where they are? And if you're here, I just want to speak specifically to you. If you're listening online, just open up your heart to the Lord and say, Jesus, come into my life. I surrender to you. I don't understand all of this but I want to know you. Thank you for coming into this world to die for my sin. And I thank you that you rose again. And I ask that you would fill me with your spirit. God, today, fill us with your spirit. Draw us near. I pray for those that are struggling through deep emotional heartache, through confusion, through anxiety. Let them know that you love them. Draw them to yourself. And God, use us. Use us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Over to my right, to your left, if you want to come and pray, we would love to pray with you.